Modern Version reads, an excellent woman, one who is spiritual, spiritual, capable, intelligent, and virtuous, is hard to find. Her value is more genuine, precious than jewels, and her worth is far above rubies or pearls. Now, there have been many excellent women over the last 50 years that I've been a member of this church in the life of the Bible United Methodist Church. Here's a few of them that come to my mind. I'm sure you'll think of others. There was sweet Jane Woodward, who served the United Methodist women for many years as treasurer, and Anna Fitzpatrick, who loved to read, and she encouraged us to begin a library here at our church. Francis Morgan served as our local UMW as well as the district UMW as president, and she was also the very first woman to serve as the chairman of our administrative council. There were many white disciples among our UMW members, such as Louise Harvey, Tansy Davis, Elsie Free, Mary Lee Gregory, Ethel Gregory, Mary Lee Molly. Jean McAnally, Martha Tippett, Catherine Renfro, Doc Morgan, and Vanille and Francis Davison. They were always publicly vocal, but they got things done. Children learned about the love of Jesus and important messages in the Bible during Sunday school and Bible school under leadership of Ms. Ruby Coppage, Ben Powers, and Evans. For decades, our men's Bible class was led by Myra Campbell, who was an inspiring and dedicated teacher. Catherine Brooks and Sarah Fulham took care of our babies in the nurseries, and while our, our parents, their parents attended Sunday school worship service. And who can forget Miss Jane Mason, a stalwart Sunday school teacher and organist who commanded our attention to detail. She served our church, church for over 50 years, and, and as testimony to her contributions, there's a little slipper that she wore when she played the organ on display in the Sunday school classroom that now bears her name. And when Jane and Joanne Harper got together on a piano and all we do it, she always just ran out of the younger spine. Elaine Taylor, who learned the piano on her grandfather's knee at age four and could play almost any song by ear if you sang it to her, shared her musical talents with us for many years. Miss Betty McGraw, she was our church secretary for over 20 years. She made sure the bulletin and the beacon were organized and printed in a timely manner. And that was in the days before a computer and a photocopier, copier, and she used only a typewriter and a mimeograph machine. Women have supported the United Methodist Women's Organization for decades, serving as local circle chairs, elected officers in, the, in our local union or as district district. From America's district officers. Our oldest living circle member is Miss Mary Bowen. Women with 30 or more years in our local circles include Benny McGraw, Peggy King, Kathy Morgan, Kathy Bird, Kay Chadwick, Janice Turner, and myself. Thank you for your service, ladies. Now, today, the women of the United Methodist Church continue the legacy of our former mothers and our sisters in Christ. Our roles may have changed a bit over the last 50 years, but the love and care has shown is just the same. Today, we want to recognize these excellent women. Now, ladies, in my Sunday school class today, we said, uh, can you follow directions? We're going to sit, right? Come forward and receive a small token of our appreciation as I call your group. Volunteers at Open Hearts, led by Allison Mason. I mean, Allison's here. Allison's here. Allison Bowen. Come on up. Kathy and Kay are going to give you a little token. I'll tell you about those in just a second. Team leaders and workers at the Lord's Pantry, shared by John Mason. Got that one right. You're a team leader or you work at the Lord's Pantry. Come up. If you are a member of the Administrative Council led by Linda West. <coughs> if you are a former or present Sunday school teacher, a Bible school teacher or leader, a worship leader, 
a musician, a choir member, a reader, a liturgist, liturgist. I'm not saying we get up. <laughs>
words. Um, so the scripture this morning is a little on the long side, and so I decided that I would try, we would try to spice it up a little bit. So uh, instead of just reading, we, we have a dramatic uh, interpretation from the scripture this morning. And so I'm going to invite Michael and uh, Beth, and uh, I'm the narrator, and uh, Michael is Jesus. It's okay, you know, he's he is, he is the more Jesus than she is the Samaritan woman. Like, this was not typecasting. So. All right, I'll go on. <laughs> so he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. Now his disciples had gone to the city to buy food, and the Samaritan woman said to him, A Jew asked him for a drink for me, a Samaritan woman. Now Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. So Jesus answered her. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you the reward. Sir, you have no money, and the well is dead. Where do you get that living? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well and his sons and lots drank from him? Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give, give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty. Or how do you come in here to draw water? Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband. You were right in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. Sir, I see that you're a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming, and is now here, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit, and in truth. For the Father seeks the, such as these to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When He comes, He will proclaim all things to us. I am He, the one who is speaking to you. Just then, Jesus' disciples came. They were astonished that He was speaking with a woman. But no one said, What do you want? Why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left the water jar and went back to the city. Come, see a man who has told me everything I've ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Surely no one has brought him something to eat. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do you not say four months more, then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around you and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For 
For here the saying holds true. One sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I've ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior. The word of God for the people of God. Have you ever heard of the Modesto Manifesto? Knew what that is. This was a covenant of sorts that was made by four gentlemen, Cliff Barrows, Grady Wilson, George Beverly Shea, and of course, Billy Green. They gathered in the city of Modesto, gathered in the city of Modesto, California, to, as the ministry was building to a bigger and bigger following, to sort of set for themselves some guidelines for their work, some things that they would hold themselves accountable to. Now, three of them are lesser known. One of them is so well known that it has become known as the Billy Graham Rule. The three of them, other than, than the Billy Graham rule, was first of all to avoid any appearance or actual evil with money. They didn't want to uh, overhype money. They didn't want to preach a prosperity gospel. They didn't want to push giving to the ministry. They just wanted to make offerings, opportunities available, and then went from there. Uh, another was to not denigrate the local church. They didn't want people to become followers of their ministry. They wanted to lead people to Jesus and then see them connect with local pastors and local churches. They did not want to become a church. And the fourth of that was to be careful in publicity, to make sure that they were always telling the truth as they talked about their work. They, they promised not to exaggerate numbers or salvations or all these kinds of different things. But, the, but one of the rules that became known and has become known through the years as the Billy Graham rule was this, that none of those gentlemen would ever spend any time with a woman who was not their wife alone. Now this came up more recently in our history when uh, Mike Pence made news for telling the people that he and his wife had followed that the Billy Graham rule through the years. He was always careful. Mike Pence particularly said he never died alone with a woman other than his wife. Uh, and there are a couple of more things about how he uh, did that. People criticized him for that and said it was old fashioned and, and, and sort of a time of, of yesteryear. It, it, and of course now, uh, as we are in a world, uh, I know as a pastor, I never, I do my best to avoid being alone. <laughs> As well, sometimes I know I'm going to go visit someone in their house or whatever. Uh, very often, those folks have been old enough to be my grandmother or mother, and so it has not been too troublesome. But I try to be careful uh, as well to avoid any real evil or any appearance of evil. So imagine my surprise when, as I began to read commentary on this scripture this week, that uh, one of the commentators led with the fact that the religious leaders and rabbis of Jesus' day would have followed something very similar to this Billy Graham rule. And it would have been scandalous even for them to have been caught uh, in conversation alone with a woman. And that's exactly what uh, we find today. We find Jesus crossing a boundary. In that day, women were not definitely not equal to men in their culture. 
And we've spent a long time trying to rectify uh, those changes. Uh, I know that sometimes uh, United Methodists uh, have been uh, alone among churches in our communities uh, to, to have uh, women as clergy. And I have been in situations where I've seen um, uh, Baptist churches or, or other churches in particular say you can't have that community service in our sanctuary if the woman pastor will be preaching because they just simply don't allow it. Now others, uh, I don't malign all Baptists, others have been more hospitable. Even though they have their own theology about that, they have been open to allow whatever was happening from the community to happen. But, of course, uh, we have women clergy in multiple Methodist denominations uh, and in uh, many Pentecostal denominations were ahead of us, even in uh, ordaining women. My mother says growing up, her, past her pastor's wife was a better preacher than he was. <laughs> she remembers that to this day. Um, so I say all this to remind us of how shocking this scene should be to us. Remember, I've been saying to us that as we try to listen to Jesus, that it's very hard sometimes for us to, to reconnect with how uh, scandalous or shocking some of these communications and these things that Jesus had to say were because we've become so familiar with them. Jesus uh, talking to this woman, it was a shock to her. It was a shock to his disciples who observed it, and it was clearly outside of what was expected. He had a reputation as a holy man and as a Jew. So there were two good reasons why he shouldn't have been talking to her. Now, you've heard pastors and teachers through the years, if you uh, have been to church before, talk about the Samaritans and the relationships that Jews have with Samaritans. The Samaritans, in their minds, were, were half breed mixed race, uh, and they had other history. They just looked down on them. Uh, it was a scourge to have to walk through this horrible territory in order to get to other places that you wanted to be. And so, uh, for Jesus to be so open to speak to this Samaritan is also uh, sort of another layer of this shock. It's hard to imagine how to put together a couple of people in today's culture that would represent the difference here. I, I said, uh, maybe if we could imagine Donald Trump talking to a Haitian refugee or something. I really don't know. I'm trying to, to think of the biggest sort of cultural, political chasm you can think of between two people and imagine how this would, this would go down. And remember that just last week, we came off of the conversation Jesus was also having with a Pharisee, which was also a group he was at odds with. So, so what we have here are these conversations where Jesus uh, is crossing, last week, religious authority lines, this week, ethnicity, politics, and gender lines. So he speaks to the Samaritan woman, and you've heard the conversation. You don't need, need to rehearse it. In fact... This, this story is so substantive, it really ought to be a three-week series rather than just one week on this. But Jesus, as he always does, finds a way to connect with who he's speaking with. I believe Jesus had the end game of this conversation in his mind from the very beginning. And he knew her through and through. And he decided to engage with this woman cross-culturally with what they have in common. That was the need for something to Bill Graham had once said, Jesus was not a white man. He was not a black man. He came from that part of the world that touches Africa and Asia and Europe. Christianity is not a white man's religion. And don't let anybody ever tell you that it's white or black. Christ, he said, belongs to all people. He belongs to the whole world. You know, Jesus lived his whole life within a very small land area. If you ever have the opportunity to travel to Holy Land, one of the things that you'll find most shocking is how small and close together everything is that when you have read these stories in the scripture through the years, they have always seemed epic and larger than life. Uh, when you get there and you realize that you get on a bus and be in Bethlehem from Jerusalem in 20 minutes, you go, oh, in our mind we have these places so far away and, and 
and, and we realize pretty quickly, we start looking at that, that Jesus, the, the most significant human being ever walked the planet, didn't go very far. He, he spent his whole life like right here. But it's in scenes like this that we see and are reminded that Jesus didn't come just for the Jews. He came for all of us. He came for the whole world. The little children's song used to say, red and yellow, black and white. Now, I don't know if that's politically correct anymore to even say that. But it acknowledges the reality that Jesus was good news for the whole world. After talking to her about this living water, Jesus gets right to the point of calling out our sins. Now, that doesn't, we don't like that very much. We want to remember this nice, sweet, kind Jesus. We don't, we don't usually put pictures up in church of Jesus turning over the tables in the temple and, and making a mess and fussing about everything. Or when he calls people out of their sin, we like sweet, kind Jesus walking with children in his hand. But Jesus called out our sin, called it right out loud. Now, it's one thing when the preacher preaches a sermon that steps on your toes because you think I know something about you. But you certainly would be another thing for me to sit in the office and list off all of your stuff one by one, now wouldn't it? And I think that she just tries to change the subject after he does this. It seems pretty clear. She, she starts to talk about someone else. She said she acknowledges that there must be something special about him because he's been able to, to see through her life in this way. But immediately, she begins to talk about the traditions of worship. And how the people uh, have, have that he is a Jew and basically thinks of holy places to have worship. Worship on the on the mountain, worship in the temple, of course. And Jesus answers her with some shocking news. Just as we got shocking metaphor for salvation of being born again last night to or excuse me, last week to a Pharisee. This week we have a shocking idea of what worship looks like. You see, for the for the Jews, worship had always been about a holy place. Real worship happened in the temple. People made pilgrimages to worship in the temple to be obedient. And of course, we as you look throughout the Old Testament, a lot of times altars, most of the time when altars were built, they were built to remember something that God had done in a particular place, right? Uh, at um, Shiloh this morning, we say as I'm closing, you know, come thou fount of every blessing. It has that verse in it. Here I raise mine Ebenezer. I grew up a whole lot. I had thought of the world that man. Um, it, it's, it's that stone. It's that, it's that altar stone that remembers where God did a mighty thing. So, Jesus is saying, you, that's the way we should be. But, but here's a new way. God is asking us to worship in spirit and in truth. Not in a place, but in a way. That, that God is a spirit and He wants to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. That, that it's more about the worship of earth than the place. You see, Jesus knows that the Holy Spirit is going to be poured out on all flesh. Not just on a select few. And that we will all indeed have the ability to have the Spirit in us and to worship in a different way. Last week, Jesus delivered one of the most popular and well-known theology of salvation to a religious elite in the middle of the night. And here he is given one of the greatest messages about the, the bigness and, and the change and how we will very well worship the living God to a foreign woman completely outside of the community. And what happens? The woman becomes an evangelist, says the she. she begins to run and tell the news. She, she, she goes and she begins to tell this man saw every knew everything about him. And people are coming to believe in Jesus because a serial marriage and adulterous woman is, is willing to say he saw me. He knew me through and through. This is not the first woman to go running with good news about Jesus' is way well, Easter Sunday morning. The very first evangelists who told the good news of a resurrected Savior were women 
God, the king of the, the, the creator of the world, entrusted the good news of an empty tomb to women to go and tell the message. Now, this story today ends with a little twist. And I love this because this gets to the heart of witnessing and of worship. I don't know if you caught it, the story was long. But at the very end, it says that those folks who had, who had come to believe in Jesus because of the woman's testimony, they say this, they say, actually that's not now what I believe. I believe now because I've seen it for myself. Folks, I think that's what's important for us as we think about witnessing to our faith. We know the statistics tell us most of us do not witness to our faith. We know this. The percentage of, of Christians in today's church, of all denominations, witness very good. We do not go out and tell the good news of Jesus. There are so many reasons I think that is possible, that is. That is. And, and, and we're not going to go over all those today. But, but think about this. This woman went and told everyone she could find of her encounter with Jesus and what he did for her. He, he knew her. He, he named her sin. That doesn't seem like something you, you would imagine. She would have been excited about it, do you? But somehow, in their ongoing interaction, Jesus loved her. And he showed her grace. And she felt like something had been lifted from her. This promise of, of eternal living water. And so she began to go and tell that. I think that's how simple it is. We have, have you encountered Jesus? Do you encounter Jesus? One of my greatest concerns of what we know witness is because maybe it's been so long since we've had a fresh experience with Jesus that we don't really have much to say. And that's on us. We come to God looking for more and more. That's why we set aside a season of Lent, is to come to listen to Jesus more closely. What could you run and tell the village about what Jesus has done for you? But here's the thing. She didn't go with a mandate from someone for how many people she was supposed to talk to. She didn't, she didn't have to report back to some evangelism committee or some statistical report how many people came and actually did. She just did what was natural. She had a mighty experience with a miraculous Jesus who knew her in a supernatural way and then she responded and went and told. But ultimately, the people didn't remain in their belief because of the witnesser they remained in their belief and grew in their faith because they met Jesus. Did you catch that? We put too much responsibility on ourselves when it comes to witnessing to our faith. We feel like we have to somehow be the, su the success. All we have to do is tell the story. And Jesus will, will win and will change hearts. Did you catch that? At the end of the story, we don't believe anymore because of what this woman said. We believe because we've met Jesus. Ultimately, God is good. Jesus gives her a word about worship because I think we worship in spirit and truth when we have a story to tell. I've always said, that I don't think. I, if, if, if we had a church full of people having experiences with Jesus, I don't think I'd have to beg you to come to church on Sunday. I think you want to be here. You want to respond and celebrate what God's doing in your life. God is good. Jesus is alive. Even as we move closer to the Easter story, we remember that the end of the story is a risen Lord. A, a, a Jesus who's alive and who's seated at the right hand of God the Father interceding for us. So let's worship Him. Each and every day, not just on Sundays. Let's worship the God who is alive, who saves us from eternal death and rose again so that we can have eternal life. Let's worship in spirit and truth now and forevermore. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all God's people say. Thank you. Amen.